Thanks, Paul, for the introduction. I'd like to start with congratulating Paul and the IHEAT team for the vision and the courage they have uh, to put themselves at the forefront of this uh, new community um, centered around mobile health education. And uh, for, I wanted to thank HMH, Horton, uh, uh, Harcourt, HMH for uh, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt for their support. So um, today I'm going to uh, talk about uh, three things, the uh, challenges, the uh, opportunities, but um, let's start with uh, uh, really the um, good news and the bad news and the implications. So um, the question is, who is going to pay for health education? And I did some research because I know certainly the Bohr Foundation won't be able to uh, pay for it, uh, certainly not alone, uh, neither do others. And um, there is no such field as health education that can just be looked up in terms of who is funding it. But we do know a lot about health um, and health spend. And here are you know, the numbers behind it. So who is paying currently for health? It is on the international border crossing side, we have the bilaterals, we have the multilaterals, which together make up two thirds of it. Uh, we have the Global Fund, we have Gates in green, we have the NGOs, and you see this incredible growth, and it grew from uh, about 6 million in 1990 to 27 billion in uh, uh, today. These are the estimates. And so that's incredible growth on, on, on this side. And uh, that's what most people might have in mind when they think about health and health spend. But the bigger surprise for me when I looked it up actually is that the in-country numbers if you look at it, this, while it grew a little bit slower, it grew by 6% over the last years. Actually, the numbers are almost 10 times as high. So the numbers in country, there's more money available and being spent than comes across the border. And I think that gets much less publicity and is much less known. So these are you know, the big, big picture numbers. Putting this though in perspective also, Let's look at the United States. The United States is spending about $2.4 billion um, every, uh, not billion, sorry, trillion dollars, $2.4 trillion on health uh, in the United States alone. So this is kind of the good news. So when we look at this and we look at this incredible growth and there are very few industries actually that have um, experienced such an incredible growth, sustained growth of the, over the last two decades, then we would think health education, which is a part of it, you know, should you, we, we should be able to find money, right? So, well, let's have a look at the next slide. This one here takes a different perspective. It doesn't look at the aggregate, the total numbers. It breaks it down and says how much is available actually on health spend, how much is spent per person. And the news here are slightly different. The first thing is, if you look, look, look at the numbers here, how much is available per person, per capita? In Ghana, it's $114. In uh, South Africa, it's 840. In Uganda, it's $112. That's in comparison to two to $4,000 for uh, countries who are leading in terms of um, uh, low burden of disease and in terms of uh, longevity of life. It is in comparison to $8,000 that is spent in the United States per capita. So the levels per capita are pretty small. The second part is um, there is a good component here, out-of-pocket expenses. If you look at this, it is for Ghana, it is you know, $45 out of $114 is out-of-pocket. South Africa, it is 18%, it is less, much less, and in Uganda, it's even 54% of the total health spend is actually out of pocket. So the question was, who pays for health expense? It's individuals. It's the people who get services. But the bad news is that those people who spend for that, they are not spending it on prevention. And health education, to the largest extent, is about prevention. So that's not going to be available. So if we look from that point of view then, 
and say, okay, we need to take out of our total, we need to take out the uh, out of pocket, so that comes out. So we, let's say we are generous and let's say the government funding is available for some health debt funding and let's say we count in the total and let's put in the NGO firms and plans and mostly the NGOs um, and then let's make an assumption here. Let's say $5% uh, is available for health education. Why 5%? If I looked up some of the leading countries, it's about 3 to 5% in terms of health, what's spent on, on um, prevent, uh, prevention and uh, public health rather than on treatment. So let's take here a generous number, 5% of what might be available and what do we get? We get about two to three dollars per person for health education available. That's not as much anymore, is it? So, what does it now mean? So the question doesn't become anymore who pays for health debt. The question becomes actually how can we create more money for health debt because it has such huge potential. Number one, and the second question, which is just as relevant, how can you make sure? your efforts get some of that money, right? So these are really the two questions that we need to ask. How can we grow the pie and how can you get some of the pie? So from experiences of working with private foundations but also with uh, bilaterals uh, uh, and corporations and uh, uh, multilaterals, I think this would, be my, uh, this would be my three points of advice. The first one is here, you know, focus on the outcomes, not on technology. You know, I only dipped into health education due to iHeat about a year ago. And before it was all embedded into, in, in the verticals. And now as I started to meet with some of the, you know, technology-based companies, all they talk about is technology. And um, I think that's the potential, that's the leverage, but as a funder, you know, that's really just a tool, right? Technology and, and health education itself is just a tool. The, what we want is the outcomes and we need to know how we can use those tools in order to get to the outcome. And that's really the most important, that's the starting point. So it's about outcomes more than it is about technology. The second part is even if the outcomes are there, it needs to be outcomes that are embedded in, in true and real understanding of the uh, consumer, of the end recipient. And it cannot be a public health intervention top down, but it needs to be embedded and knowing uh, the learners behind it. And then the outcomes here, here in, they need to be multiple, it's not enough to have one. So for health education, what is it? It needs to start with reducing mor morbidity, uh, mortality. It needs to be about saving money and time resources, saving resources. It needs to be about making life more convenient. If it is more convenient, the chances that it will be taken on, taken up are much, much larger. It's about simplicity. And then it should have a dimension of being self-funding after a certain number of years. It can't go on forever. And if these four components are there, it also means it's scalable. Scalability is not something that you start with. Scalability is a result of having multiple pieces and outcomes such as these. So that would be the first kind of recommendation. The second one is, uh, you know, position yourself in high level and high growth areas. What does this mean? This is just, this is if you want to be a mainstream, part of the mainstream funding arena. There are always niche plays, right? But this is if you look at the numbers. So what are those numbers? Uh, what are those areas? If in, in terms of focus areas, I would think that it is maternal and child health. Why? Because uh, last September uh, at the MDG uh, conference, uh, just $40 billion was spent to go in this sector. And I think in terms of attention, after we had the primary attention on HIV, TB, and malaria, it really has shifted into maternal and child health. So that's certainly a good uh, area to be involved in. Also because if you look at comparative funding in, embedded in uh, maternal and child health is TB, it's diarrhea. Diarrhea which hits at about two years is the peak, right? So that's part of this under five mortality. 
and child health. And it totally is, is neglected, you know, both uh, diarrhea and TB, and it will eventually come to the top. So maternal and child health, HIV, 23% of all the money that flows over borders is related to HIV at this point. And it has been going up and up and up um, over the past. So do I agree with it? You know, maybe not, but it doesn't matter. This is what the numbers tell you where, where you would want to be if you want to uh, um, get a part of the pie. Um, program geographies, Sub-Saharan Africa uh, is the region that gets uh, most of the money that is actually crossing borders. Within that, there are five countries, most of them uh, on, on, on the horn, that um, are actually the largest recipients, and that uh, uh, is complemented by Nigeria um, on the west side. And if you take a global picture, number one in terms of uh, recipients is India at this point. So if you are in one of those areas and you have operations, you're much more likely to be able to fit it in with some of the international donors because they say it fits one of our geographies. Um, and then in terms of donor geographies, the reality is that, in, and this is looking again at only the border crossing uh, uh, development assistance, 50% uh, of all uh, the, de uh, the development assistance in health is actually originating in the United States with uh, government or with uh, foundations such as Gates uh, and others. Um, also Western Europe, which is the next biggest block in terms of access to the Euro European Commission, etc. So this is kind of the uh, uh, where you would wanna be. And then the last one is just making the smart ask. What, does, what do I mean with that? What I mean is, that when you make a proposal and you move forward, research and evidence based is, is, is critical for all the funders. It doesn't matter which one it is. Um, and then uh, it is about put yourself in funder's shoes. Um, and everyone thinks it's quite fun to be a funder, and, and it usually is. But it also means that you have to turn, turn down about 99 out of 100 people who request. And so if you put yourself in that, those shoes, you start to see what would you want to see actually it really makes you a uh, um, uh, much better partner. Um, and uh, finally, I think it's building your brand. The donors talk among each other and increasingly it's not just within one kind of foundation, it reaches across and uh, build your brand uh, on the promise over deliver. Um, I wanted to add uh, an example, but I don't have time. But um, I think the dialogue is more important and I personally think um, uh, health education, as it is linked in particular to community health work, is one of the biggest potentials and opportunities we have for this decade. And congratulations to all of you who are taking this on and making a difference in the field. Thank you.